Good afternoon. My name is Lene Palmasano, and I'm the chair of Committee of the Whole. I'm going to call to order our regular committee meeting for Tuesday, June 28th. At this time, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll and verify the presence of a quorum. Councilmember Payne. Present. Councilmember Wansley. Present. Councilmember Rainville. Present. Councilmember Vita. Present. Councilmember Ellison. Here. Councilmember Osman. Here. Councilmember Goodman. Present. President Jenkins. Present. Councilmember Chugtai. Present. Councilmember Koski. Present. Councilmember Johnson. Present. Vice Chair Chavez. Present. Chair Palmasano. Present. That's 13 members present. Thank you. Let the record reflect that we have a quorum. We have five items on today's published agenda in addition to our reports of committees. We also have two items to add today um, reg regarding the Hiawatha Maintenance Facility and the Housing and Rent Stabilization Work Group. Um, I'd like to take, without objection from my colleagues, I'd like to take up the items in this order that seems to make the most sense as I discuss this with the clerk's office. First, we'll have the current service level budget report from Director Kruver. Um, then we will do the government restructure committee. Those are the other, those are the items two, three, four, and five on the agenda. Then we will have the update on the Hiawatha maintenance facility, then the rent stabilization work group conversation, and then finally committee reports. Are there any objections to that order today? Great. Um, so with that, I will welcome up Director Kruver to, there you are, um, to do the current service level budget report. Welcome. Very good. Thank you so much, Chair Palmasano. And I'm Amelia Kruver. I'm the budget director. Today, my entire team will be getting up to tell you about their particular pieces of expertise in the budget. So they will be getting up and introducing themselves as well. Um, we are here today to talk about where we're at in the budgeting process. So we refer to this as the current service level budget. This is a, no new decisions have been made in this budget. We are simply going to be forecasting the cost of the people and programs approved in last year's budget into 23 and 24. And so in our charter, there is a requirement that before July 1st, we have a, a report out of the revenues and expenditures for all city departments. Uh, in previous years, we've done this in a very informal way. This year, we're trying to formalize and bring some more transparency to this part of the budget process. So the agenda today is to review the cost of our current service level. So the revenues that we expect, um, or rather the spending that we expect for the people and the programs that are already approved by the council and the mayor. We're going to explore our revenue forecast for 23 through 27. So we always put together a five-year outlook for our revenues. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit more about timing and the next steps for our budget process. Oh, there we go. Much better. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so before we get started, I just I don't want to bury the lead. Uh, looking at our uh, budget, the financial takeaways that I hope to leave you with is that our expenses are growing at just under 4% across all funds. Pretty normal increase, inflationary increase. Uh, around revenues, we are increasing at right at 4% at this point in time. Um, we're seeing limited resources available for new spending in the general fund in particular, where revenues are slightly underperforming where we thought we would be at last year at this point, um, and expenses are growing about as projected, um, slightly faster than predicted. So that dynamic in the general fund is putting a strain on resources available for new spending, and we will get into how we, uh, how we forecast those revenues and expenditures in the following presentation. And once again, I just want to remind everyone that this is a snapshot in time. There are no decisions, there's no recommendations included in this. That will happen, uh, the next checkpoint on this journey will be when the mayor releases his recommendations in August. So this is really just telling us where's our starting point for decision making. All right, and with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Jane. 
Good afternoon, I'm Jane Desenza. I'm a senior budget analyst on the team and I'm just gonna set up some of the components of the base budget. So the current service level is our building block for the next year's budget and it's comprised of three different buckets of spending. So we have the calculated personnel, we have internal service charges, and we also have the base or the non-personnel base. Um, all of these processes are driven by our financial policies, which we've included on the slide, and you'll hear us referencing them throughout this presentation. Um, you'll see that inflation is captured in the first two of those spending buckets, so calculated personnel and internal service charges tend to fluctuate given um, circumstances, labor agreements, steps, all of these sorts of factors. And the base budget, the non-personnel, is held flat year to year. So that is my very brief introduction. I'll turn over to my colleagues. We're going to get into a little bit more detail for you. Thank you, Jane. Uh, Chair Pulpistano, Council Members, my name is Justin Carlson. I'm one of the budget analysts. And the first item of our current service level we're going to discuss today is personnel. So personal expenses do fluctuate year to year. They're not held flat. So we have an annual update process to really capture those changes. And it consists of two phases. In the first phase, we collaborate with human resources and departments to update our workforce plan. So the objective here really is to get the current incumbent employee budget in the correct position, and then we look at different inputs, thank you, such as their step, their uh, classification, and then also their healthcare coverage. So we're updating that workforce plan, and then in the second phase, we're looking at cost assumptions in the budget. So again, another collaborative approach with human resources, to look at cost assumptions such as the step table and colas that come from our collective bargaining agreements. We look at other items like medical and dental employer contributions, which change year to year. Some of these are relatively stable, like FICA and Medicare. Others are uh, changed year to year or periodically are renegotiated, like life insurance and long-term disability. So again, these were uh, completed in March and April. We did a lot of these updates. And once the cost assumptions are updated and the workforce plan is up to date, we then calculate salary and fringe uh, for our personnel budget. This entire personnel update, this annual update we do is in accordance with financial policy 1.7. So as we're looking from 2022 to 2023, we know personnel is a significant portion of the city's budget. For total operating costs, it makes up 43% of the budget. If we look at just the general fund, it's 68% of the budget. So again, this is very significant spending for the city. Looking at 2022 to 2023, we see modest growth into 2023 that actually comes in below our benchmark expectations. And then looking out to 2024, we return to more of a standard inflationary growth in that year. There are several drivers of why we're seeing this modest growth in 2023. I just want to highlight one of them for the council here, and that is our medical self-insurance fund. So on average, we budget 5% annual increases in medical self-insurance. That's already relatively low compared to market trends. If you see other headline numbers of six, 10, even double digit, uh, growth rates in medical care um, that other municipalities are seeing. We don't see those headline numbers here. We're actually projecting a decrease down to 3% in 2023. And that's a result of the 2018 decision for the city to become self-insured for medical care coverage. That has saved tens of millions of dollars for the city. And it doesn't come at the expense of service, which is really important. I want to thank our partners in human resources and the broader finance team. that they're able to identify cost savings, such as the medical self-insurance plan, and other negotiated rates like our long-term disability and our life insurance policies that result in cost savings, and we're able to see that modest growth in personal costs, not at a reduction to, of service level, which is really important. Um, I'll next turn it over to Neil, who will discuss internal service charges. Hello, Chair Palmasamo and members of the committee. I am going to cover the internal service charges. My name is Neil Younghands. I'm the Principal uh, Budget and Evaluation Analyst. Um, I'm going to cover internal service charges and then a few other slides later in the presentation. Um, but to start with, uh, internal service charges are, these are charges for department's rent, vehicle, equipment charges, IT costs, so if there's a program or um, some software that uh, departments need, uh, support, contracts, phones, uh, computers, uh, these are all, and some portions of the self-insurance funds, that's all covered within these internal service charges. Um, and the process for this is which we, we started developing this in the beginning of the year in January or February. So we, took, uh, we asked departments uh, to submit expense budgets and we uh, use a benchmark to check how, how much those costs are going over every year um, to check for inflation and benchmark those and pull out some items that we think that are going up faster than inflation. 
Um, and any, in, any of those increases we try to call out and, um, and uh, investigate a little bit more. In 2023, we have 113 million budget, which is a 17% increase from our 2022 budget numbers. Um, and that is likely due to those uh, standard inflationary costs that I was just mentioning, as well as some larger items. So there's HRS, which is an IT system, um, which is for around $3 million, and then fleet replacement, which these are for um, departments spending on uh, changing out their vehicles. Um, it looks like a large increase. Uh, it's a $7 million increase from 2022, but that's because those we were still doing those fleet replacements, but those just coming out of the fleet fund balance. Um, so it's not showing up in this actual chart right here. Um, and then there is the liability costs. Uh, those went up by $5 million, and that's based on a third-party actuarial study. Um, and that budget is based on our uh, partners in risk management. So I think I'm going to turn it over to... Okay, and then back to that third component of the CSL, the base budget, the non-personnel base, which is held flat. Um, this one's much more simple to calculate. We essentially take the 2022 adopted budget data and strip out any one-time items, um, and that's the, that's the base for 2023. So you'll see on your screen $6.4 million in one-time change items came out of that overall total. Um, and then $24 million in 2022's budget for the one-time self-insurance fund transfer is also removed from there. And again, referencing our financial policies, any uh, ongoing service level commitments are the basis for the next year's budget. So just trying to uh, tie those policies in to reality here. So this is a view of the current service level budget in two different uh, glimpses. On the left is the expenses by category. And then on the right is expenses by department. Um, so you will be getting department by department detailed budget presentations in the fall, so we won't go too into depth, but you'll see that the three biggest departments are the ones who are typically um, in that position. So public works, police, and the city coordinator are, are usually our three largest departments. And then on the category side, you'll see that personnel accounts for uh, quite a substantial portion of the CSL, as well as contractual services and uh, capital equipment. Okay. Ms. Desenza, just to clarify, sure. these are all this, this is all year's. Funds. This is the 2023 CSL all funds view. Got it. Yep. Thank you. So this is the starting point before any of those decisions are made or the mayor's recommended. Any other questions before we move on? I'm not seeing any in queue. Um, you can also use your flag if I'm not seeing any. Great. And I'll turn it back to Neil to talk about capital. Um, so our capital program is a six year uh, long planning period. So the first year is in which the one that we're actually appropriating slash authorizing dollars for. Um, so you'll notice on the slide it says 22 through 27. This is the amount that was adopted from last year. And so that 2023 number is actually a planning number. And so our net, our uh, uh, bond redemption levy, those numbers are support this level of investment across these different areas. Um, but just for a, a brief breakdown on like the process, so it goes through department request phase, so departments submit their whole list of projects they'd like to see, um, and then it goes into the capital long range improvement committee, um, and then it goes to the mayor's phase, and then to the council phase. So the capital long range improvement committee click uh, just wrapped up their work last week, um, and they're still working on uh, producing their annual report that's due in July, um, and then we will uh, bring that through to the mayor's recommended phase after that. Um, but so on your screen, you'll see right now is uh, you'll see that for 2022, we appropriated or authorized $233.6 million. Um, and that's a mix of revenue sources. So that could be net debt bonds, cash. Um, some of that likely inclu includes intergovernmental uh, revenues like uh, uh, county grants or federal grants. Um, and so to 2023, we're, uh, we're planning on $216.2 million in um, program resources. So now we're about to jump over to revenues, and I just figured I'd pause one more time and see if there are questions about sort of our walk through how we are calculating expenditures for this part of the budget. I'll just say not yet. Okay, <laughs> makes sense. <laughs> so now we're going to switch gears and talk about revenues. This pie chart shows uh, all 
all of our revenues across all funds in the city. And so I just, before we dive into what our forecast looks like, I just want to sort of remind us uh, that we have taxes are the top blue section, green is the bottom section, and I think that when we think about the city budget, we are often really focused on the general fund. The main source of revenues for the general fund is property taxes. And so the whole city budget, however, does include utility funds, special revenue funds, other enterprise funds. And that's where we're collecting largely fees for service. So we're collecting fees, but those fees are very restricted in how we can spend them. So the general fund is our most flexible uh, fund where we can spend money on a lot of our core business or core government services. Utilities uh, and other funds tend to be where we collect money, but then are restricted and have to spend that money on providing that service, so water, things like that. So this is the whole picture. We'll now walk through our forecast as well as uh, the different components of our general fund and other funds. Chair Paul Masano, council members, my name is Ben Zimmerman. I'm a senior budget and evaluation analyst in the budget office. Um, the first thing I want to do is just take a, a quick look at the second largest category here on the slide, taxes, and just provide some clarity as to what that is. Um, you can see that the largest bucket, when we drill down one level, is property taxes. That is inclusive of property taxes rolling into the general fund for those operations, but also our debt service levy and uh, tax increment finance revenue to support those activities. Additionally, additionally, we have local sales tax revenue and franchise fees. So. That's just taking a moment to clarify what all revenue streams roll up into that taxes bucket and add that piece of clarity. That being said, uh, we'll take a step back out to look at it again, uh, the total revenue picture for all funds with some historical actuals and our forecast through 2027. There's a pretty straightforward uh, picture here to tell. We can see starting out in 2019 from about $1.4 billion coming in and uh, steady contraction uh, through 2022. And then we are forecasting recovery beginning in 2023. Again, as Amelia said, um, this is all funds, all revenues. So a lot of this is restricted in terms of the uses. So from here, it's important to pivot and really just spend a few slides talking about the general fund as that is the general operating fund for the city and where we have more flexibility in terms of how we use funds. We have a question or comment from Council President Jenkins. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And Mr. Zimmerman, I guess I'm just curious if, um, going back to your first slide, um, the percentage, can you talk about the percentage of property taxes, uh, residential versus commercial? Uh, Council President Jenkins, uh, Paul Lozano, uh, I, you like, know, so we don't have that broken out in this presentation. What we do have is uh, some work from the assessor's office where she can tell us how that has shifted from year to year. In this, uh, this presentation, we're not as focused on that because it doesn't include the mayor's recommendation for how to increase property taxes. Once we come forward with that in August, then we will also be talking about how does this impact the different parts of our property tax base differently. This is just sort of carrying through uh, what we had planned in future years. So um, we are happy to work with the assessor's office to talk about how that value has changed, um, but we don't have it in front of us right now. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right then, so shifting over to talk about the general fund, uh, the first visual we have up here is our forecast for 2023 revenue into the general fund. We're forecasting a, a total of, I believe, about 590 million. Uh, you can see some of the primary categories here. Taxes, again, that is largely the property taxes. We have intergovernmental revenues, uh, charges for sales and services, and a few other revenue categories. Uh, in a few subsequent slides, we're just going to try to shed some light on some important pieces telling the story of the general fund in recent years and the forecast uh, to support ongoing activities out of the general fund. And just to be clear, the intergovernmental revenues would include local government aid and what else? Yeah, there's local LGA, local government aid is the primary one. There are some other smaller state transfers as well as county, I believe, but the bulk of that would be local government aid. You are correct. And we have a subsequent slide, and I believe Amelia is going to speak a little bit more to that in our forecast there. Thank you. 
All right, shifting here again, moving to that uh, dynamic look over time. This time, just the general fund before I had the look 2019 through 2027 for all funds. Um, here, the story is a little bit different. In that previous graphic, you could see uh, the, the slow and steady contraction of, of revenue beginning in 2019 through 2022, and then slow growth forecasted from there. Here, really what we're showcasing in the general fund um, is a story of stability and actions, ta actions taken by the city to prop up and support ongoing activities out of the general fund. So I've added a few boxes here I'll call attention to. Um, beginning in 2020, there was a black box around the light purple revenue stream, which is intergovernmental revenues. You can see in 2020 that that light purple box is bigger than most years, all years in fact, and that is due to an influx of CARES Act funds, $32 million from the federal government to support our activities. Moving on to 2022 through 2024, uh, there are red boxes on uh, the transfers category of revenue towards the bottom. And what we're calling attention to there is the decision by the city to use ARPA funds uh, for revenue replacement, again, to support ongoing activities out of the general fund. Uh, and, and the amount of those annually is between 35 and roughly 35 and $45 million in revenue replacement to support the general fund. Thereafter, uh, I have purple boxes, again, over the same transfer revenue category. And what we're calling attention to there is a, a pivot back to our historical practice. You can see in 2019, um, the revenue portion in the bar chart is much larger. Uh, prior to the COVID pandemic hitting, we had a more substantial transfer from the Downtown Assets Fund, which is primarily supported by sales tax, um, to support general fund activity. So our, our outlook or our forecast is that for the next few years, we have uh, ARPA replacement, um, ARPA revenue uh, replacement to support ongoing activity. And we envision by 2025 having sufficient revenue to return to, to pivot back to that um, transfer from downtown assets to support the general fund and our economic development activities there. We have a question or comment from Council Member Wansley. Yep, just clarifying. Um, you mentioned th when did that transfer take place from the downtown assets? So, so yeah. historically, yeah, mm -hmm. we, we have the downtown assets um, financial plan. And I'll, I have a subsequent slide to speak to that revenue a bit more. Okay. But we do financial planning and balancing uh, expenses and revenues there, plan a transfer to support economic development activities out of the general fund. And prior to the pandemic, I believe that figure was around... $30 million um, in 2019, when COVID hit, it was reduced to closer to 10 or $11 million annually because we just took such a hit in revenue, there wasn't enough money left over to transfer more to support the general fund. Luckily, the CARES Act and ARPA revenue replacement was able to take the place until we envision our citywide revenue kind of taking off again and going back to that. So the asset fund goes over to the general fund? There is a transfer from the okay. downtown assets to the general fund, yes. Thank you. And uh, pivoting right from that talking point, we can jump in and talk about, this is actually a non-general fund revenue, but it ties right into what we were just discussing, that transfer into the general fund. So uh, we have our local option sales tax, and that's just an encompassing term for the five local sales taxes the city employs. The sales and use tax, entertainment tax, restaurant tax, lodging tax, and liquor tax. And uh, those revenues roll into the downtown assets fund uh, where they support the convention center, the target center, um, and debt service payments, U.S. Bank Stadium. After those uh, economic activities, economic development activities take place, there is a transfer, <coughs> pardon me, uh, to the general fund, as we were just discussing. Um, as you can see in this visual, this is a, one of the revenue streams hardest hit by the pandemic with precipitous drop-off from a high of about 92 million pre-pandemic. Uh, to build our forecast here, we engaged leadership at the convention center, reviewed various economic forecasts, spe uh, specifically looking at data pertaining to hospitality and um, business and leisure spending and travel to get a sense of what a recovery could and should look like here in the city. And that's how we built out our forecast uh, going through 2027. Um, that forecast has us returning to pre-pandemic revenue collection in 2024. And I know it doesn't look like it at all in this graphic. Uh, that is because beginning in 2021, 
the State Department of Revenue actually began withholding roughly 24 to $25 million annually for U.S. bank stadium debt payments. Uh, the city knew about that for eight or nine years prior to this. It's just very unfortunate timing that uh, when we were bottoming out po uh, in the midst of the pandemic but with less revenue, we also began paying 24 to $25 million a year for that. Uh, the last thing I'll just call attention to in terms of the graphic, 2022 may stick out to you all uh, in terms of the color coding. That is because in prior budgets, we did not forecast disaggregating by the five um, local sales tax types. And moving forward for more accuracy and precision, we are, are, are putting those in a disaggregated format into the budgets. All right, and with that, I'll have Amelia come back up. Thank you. So this is the end of our sort of overview of our revenue forecast, and I figured I would pause right here and see if there are any questions about the revenue side of our budget before we move on. Are there any other questions from my colleagues? I'm not. Uh, Council Member Payne. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I was just wondering for your forecast methodology, are there any kind of standard assumptions that go into that? I mean, obviously we have all these crazy externalities that make forecasting pretty complex, but in a kind of non-complex year, is there kind of some baseline assumptions that go into the forecast? Yes, so great question. And I, I will say that we've been really building out our revenue forecasting methods a lot in the last couple of years. And that's what you'll see reflected sort of in this slide where the 22 budget is, is one solid color. Historically, we could kind of go on what was the total last year and let's just tick this whole box up by 2%. We can't do that anymore. And that's why you see the much more detailed look at each type of tax because each type has been impacted differently by the various you know, emergency measures that have happened. Um, and, and I think for your answer, we really tailor the forecast to the kind of revenue that we're bringing in. And so we work um, quite a bit with folks in CPED when we're thinking about business and non-business license fees. We work closely with the folks, Jeff Johnson and the folks at the Convention Center. We also have engaged uh, national data sets. So we look to MMB's forecast and read through what they're producing. We're looking at their GDP growth, which has helped us a lot. We know the levels are different and the mix is different, but what are folks at a national level thinking about how quick this recovery will be is something that we factor in, especially to sales tax. Um, and then we've, uh, we've looked at specific uh, trade associations that work in hospitality in particular, because that we know has been the most uh, impacted in the last couple of years. So it, it really varies on the different revenue stream and is something that we have um, changed and improved and monitored quite a bit since 2020. Mm -hmm. Council Member Wansi. Thank you. Um, I just had a quick, quick question too. If there is any overview or um, data around the, the self-insurance fund, I know you raised it in terms of like how that correlates to some of the personnel um, yes. components. So is there, yeah, is there any way to get an overview of that one too? So I think for the for that fund in particular, um, I we will be uh, when we release the full. Uh, Mayor's budget in fit in twenty fifth or in August fifteenth, we will have more information about what that fund looks like. I think that we um, here we're just looking at high level expenditures and revenues. Um, if there are detailed questions about that fund, then I will work with uh, Lori Johnson and our partners in risk management to bring that full understanding. Just at a high level, we use. Um, uh, actuarial study, so we partner with a third party to take a look at our historical expenses, Minneapolis context, to set the amounts that need to be uh, pulled into the self-insurance fund to make sure that we're on the right side of our financial policies. And so that's what's reflected here. I will um, note that we are seeing, um, and I'll say this again at, at my closing, but we are seeing growth in uh, faster than expected in our liability charges that are going into the self-insurance fund. Um, so that is one area that's growing a little bit faster than we had predicted. In the personnel budget overall, that's offset by savings in the medical part. Um, but we can get you, um, I, I would recommend sitting down with our risk management folks because they can talk about the whole process of it. And then we'll have a more complete fund look for you in the 
full release of our budget documents. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I want to speak for a minute about LGA, because uh, this is actually having a pretty significant impact on our general fund this year. Um, since 2019, we've seen some pretty steady declines in the amount of LGA allocated to Minneapolis. In 2022, we were uh, slated to receive an additional decrease, and you can see that we were uh, held flat. There was a hold harmless bill passed by the legislature um, that helped Minneapolis and several other large cities in the state. Um, so we didn't see a decrease in the 2022 budget. In the 2023 budget, a similar bill was prepared, um, had a lot of support, but like many things, did not make it across the finish line in the legislative session. Um, and so we are seeing a $4 million drop in our LGA going into 2023. There is a reason to be hopeful around the future. Uh, the formula that calculates LGA has not been updated in a while, and there's a general consensus that these formulas should be updated regularly. Um, we are hopeful that that will lead to uh, an end to this downward trend that we've seen in LGA uh, allocations from the state. But to have a conservative approach in our five-year financial outlook, we are going to hold steady at the uh, lowered amount of about just over $64 million. Um, there, as I said, there was broad support for a hold harmless component of the tax bill that did not make it across the finish line. And if there is a special session, I think there is a, a good chance that this is included in that. Likelihood of a special session, I think, before we're making a recommendation on the budget is low. So that's why you see a $4 million drop in our LGA. And then, Director Kruver, is this the five-year outlook as spelled out in those bills, or is this just our hopes that it would remain flat? It's our hopes that it will remain flat. So the state does just a two-year budget, so the last year that we have information on right now is 2023. We are hoping it remains flat. I know that there is a, there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of work by our partners in IGR on revising the formula so that we don't see that continued decrease and maybe see a catch-up back to pre-pandemic levels. Um, so I think it, it could be the same, it could be less, it could be more. Uh, I think that there is probably a higher likelihood that we do see some revision and that uh, we don't see a continued decrease. So that's why we're just choosing to hold it flat at this low level in the forecast. Got it, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, so the next thing we're gonna talk about is enterprise fund revenue. Go ahead. So the city has uh, five enterprise funds. So this would be the municipal parking fund, the stormwater fund, solid waste and recycling, surface water and sewer sanitary, and then also the water treatment and uh, distribution services fund. Uh, across all these, it's about $353 million in revenues. Um, and you'll see municipal parking takes in about 60, or next year is uh, slated to take in about $62 million in revenues. Uh, 47.2 in the stormwater fund and 46.5 in solid waste and recycling and 97 million in the um, sanitary sewers fund and then 91 million in the water distribution fund. Um, there is a, a, a long list of uh, revenue sources across each one of these funds but you have like on and off street parking for the municipal uh, parking fund as well as towing um, and holding fees for that. Stormwater, recycling, uh, sanitary and water, They a lot of those uh, um, revenue sources are based on charges, based on our rate schedule. Um, and also within that, there are there's a lot of work for others. So we do work for the county. Um, and so those are also built into this revenue, uh, revenue scheme. If I could pause you on that previous slide. Yeah. Um, Mr. Yields, a, a question or comment from Council Member Payne. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I was just curious about um, whether or not SAC charges are represented here. I know that Met Council generally collects those, but is there a revenue share or is that 100% going to Met Council? I think the city collects about $100,000 off those SAC charges, and then the rest just goes to Met Council. Okay. Um, so, uh, in 2020, the enterprise funds attempted to hold the, their rates flat due to uncertainty due to COVID. 
Um, and as a result uh, of COVID, uh, the store, uh, sewer and water usage went down by a bit. Um, and those uh, revenues paired with a, a larger capital program, uh, some inflationary growth in their contracts and uh, inflationary amounts in electrical use um, impacted their rate plan. Um, but we did see stable revenue growth uh, or forecast across the stormwater and waste, uh, solid waste funds. Um, and you'll notice there's this dip here, um, that is the parking fund. Um, and in the near term, we are not expecting those, uh, uh, the combination between on and off street uh, parking fees to get above the pre-pandemic levels uh, in the near term. So it's just a very high level overview of these, uh, these revenue sources. And then Amelia, do you wanna? Pause here. Okay. Thank you. So that wraps up our discussion of other funds. Um, I figured I'd pause and see if there's any questions before we sort of tie it all together and wrap up. Okay, great. So this is a, a, a snapshot of where the general fund stands at this point in our budgeting process. Um, and you can't quite see here, but there is uh, some amount of revenues that we are bringing in above expenditures for this look at our current service level budget. And so just as a reminder, this doesn't include final decisions on a levy. It doesn't include final any change items or new pro spending proposal. This is just looking at where, where are we now. And when we compare this to what our forecasts were last year, when we we're looking at that multi-year view, um, we see... Uh, modest inflationary growth of the general fund, um, and we see expenses growing basically as expected. As I mentioned before, the portion of expenses that is growing slightly faster is our charges for liability, so money that is going into the liability uh, self-insurance fund. That's offset by savings in our medical and dental insurance charges. Our revenues are coming in uh, slightly under where we projected to be last year. And that's being driven largely by uh, business licenses staying pretty flat into 2023 and LGA reducing by $4 million. So the, overall, this picture puts a, puts a lot of pressure on new spending in the general fund. Um, but like I said, this is a snapshot at this point in time. The next step in the process will be the mayor's recommended budget. So on August 15th, the mayor will make his uh, budget address. We will publish a budget book with lots more information about all, all of the city departments as well as new spending proposals from the mayor. Um, in September, the Board of Estimate and Taxation will uh, make a final vote on the maximum levy. And so that will sort of set the revenue picture for decision making around the budget. From September through October, you'll be hearing deep dives from departments on how they're spending their current budget and any new proposals that are included in the mayor's recommendation. And then November, uh, we'll start public hearings uh, related to the mayor's budget, followed by markup from council and then a final vote on the 2023 budget. So this is the end of our presentation. Um, I'll Happy to answer any questions, um, but that is it for us. I'll just pause a second, see if my colleagues have any questions about this presentation. I'm not seeing any right now. I'm sure, thank you, Director, and your team. You're always very um, reachable when we have questions yes. and need something explained to us in a different way. So I think these slides are helpful and they're representative and they're certainly sharing with the public, but I think as we have individual questions, we might reach out individually. Yeah, that sounds great. All right, thank you guys so much. Terrific, so seeing no further discussion, I'll direct the clerk to please file that report. Um, next, we have the government restructure items. Um, those are items two, three, four, and five on our posted agenda. Um, these are all part of what we consider the government structure subcommittee, and that was established to receive reports and keep things all in one place, organize our work on implementation of the executive mayor and legislative council governance structure. Uh, additionally, since these items are all related, we'll have one combined presentation from Mayor Fry, um, and that will cover the mayor's proposed executive reorganization plan, funding for new positions, and the proposed appointed positions of city operations officer and community safety commissioner. So I will 
invite up the mayor, <laughs> the mayor who's running down the hall, um, <laughs> to come on in and, and give us a presentation on those items. Mr. Ebnett, do we need a couple minutes? Like one minute? All right. Um, I'll invite my colleagues to just take a brief break, and we'll anticipate that we'll start this in just a couple of minutes. This is just a one minute warning for my colleagues that will start shortly here, Mayor. Thanks for joining us.
All right, welcome back. We are going to get started here. Um, I will invite Mayor Fry to give the presentation on these items two, three, four, and five in the Government Structure Subcommittee. Welcome, Mayor. Thank you, Council Vice President. Uh, members of the City Council, it's an honor to be here with you today to provide another update on our government structure progress. Uh, and so what you will see before you here is our most recent update to the government structure proposal. Uh, this council cycle is the first time uh, that we are requesting an action to take this conversation from the theoretical, which is where it's been for several months now, uh, to begin implementation. And as all of you know, last November, the voters approved a charter change establishing a clear executive and clear legislative branch. And since December, uh, the mayor has been responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the city department. Uh, but our government structure has not been updated to account for this very significant change to our government. Uh, to make sure that we're realizing the potential, we're accounting for all of the possibilities and the opportunities ahead, and we're making our, our government more efficient, effective, responsive, and inclusive. Uh, as I've said before, the overriding goal here is, as I just mentioned, uh, to make sure that our government is working better for the people that we represent. Uh, so after careful consideration, recommendations, and feedback from the Charter Commission, uh, the government structure work group, city staff, and council members, uh, we've arrived at this organizational structure uh, truly responsive to the changes Minneapolis residents uh, asked for as part of last November's vote. Now, to be clear, uh, you're not asking, uh, being asked right now to approve uh, the entirety of any organizational structure today. That is not the subject of this action, to be clear. We are really focused right now on three key leadership uh, positions within the enterprise. So those are the city operations officer, and that is the person that will lead the Office of Public Service, the community safety commissioner who will lead the Office of Community Safety, and then finally the city auditor. Those are the three positions that will be approved uh, today. So for the remainder of this presentation, I'm gonna be outlining the actions that uh, being asked of you for this week and providing an update on our work that has been conducted over the last couple of months. Uh, on Thursday at the full council meeting, there'll be a notice of intent to bring forward ordinances uh, to create the Office of Public Service uh, and ordinance to create the Office of Community Safety. Uh, that will be the notice of, again, of introduction brought this Thursday, notice of intent. Additionally, you'll be voting on a resolution creating and funding the COO, uh, a commissioner, and the city auditor. Uh, so that's the funding for those positions. Uh, finally, I'm going to provide an update on the work of our government structure implementation teams, which has been extensive over the last several months. So let's dig into some of the specific actions for this Thursday. First uh, is the creation of the city operations officer. Uh, allocation of contingency funding and funding for a search process for that particular position, which I know several members have requested. Second is the creation of the Community Safety uh, Commissioner, an allocation of contingency funding, again, for that position and for some administrative support. Finally is the allocation for the City Auditor. So this resolution provides funding for a community safety commissioner and administrative support to start as early as mid-July and the city operations officer and city auditor to start at some point, uh, possibly in September 2022. All four positions will uh, be funded permanently in uh, my 2023 budget uh, recommendations and the city coordinator uh, role will be phased uh, out ultimately in 2023, 2022-2023. Uh, and so ultimately we'll be including these ongoing funding measures in my budget. Next slide. Next, I wanna give an update on implementation teams uh, outlined on the slide in front of you. Uh, the legal and legislative team uh, has been working on quite a, bit of, quite a few things. First, uh, drafting updated code for the, the new structure. This work is already underway. Uh, I'll note that potential charter amendments are also near completion, but resources have been dedicated for the most part to the code changes themselves for now. Uh, 
Finally, our legal team recommends describing the changes in detail within city code and keeping the charter general uh, to allow for flexibility uh, and any future changes. The operations team has also been doing work. They've been identifying new positions along with the budget resolution to fund them on the COW agenda for, I believe, June 28th. Funding for these new positions will ideally be made uh, via budget resolution using the contingency fund. There's a request for waivers from the state at MMB for the city operations officer uh, and community uh, safety commissioner, uh, which have been improved. Uh, and then for the public service team that has completed review structure, uh, they've included discussions of some details for division between community safety and public services. Uh, an example of that would be decisions like whether traffic control should stay in public services and opioid efforts should remain in health. These are all discussions that they are working through at the moment, not uh, for, again, the purview of what you are deciding on today, but just this is the work that is happening, which is quite extensive at the moment. Um, They've also provided some recommendations for city operations officer and transmitted to uh, operations team for review. And then next is the community safety team. Uh, they've reviewed and made recommendations on support team for community safety commissioner. Uh, the job description was reviewed and forwarded to the operations team. Uh, the team has also reviewed and made recommendations on composition of support for neighborhood safety and forwarded to operations team as well. The race equity team has been working with scholars uh, from Cura at the University of Minnesota to complete a race equity and inclusion analysis to level set our expectations. Uh, review of the research and findings from Cura is underway. And then the communications team started some discussions on what internal and external messaging is needed on government structure. Uh, they will also identify some opportunities for a consistent cadence of communication for city employees to understand what changes are happening and what this will mean for their departments and or individual staff positions. We know that certainly uh, this is going to be critical for our employees to, to have some stability here as we move forward. Uh, and we're going to be making every single effort to make sure that that work continues. And so I'll just close here then with the uh, updated timeline. So. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, on Thursday, there will be a notice of intent for the ordinances that will start uh, to create the new government structure. The next council meeting on July 21st will be an opportunity for introduction and first reading of those ordinances. And then on August 1st, 4th, excuse me, there will be an opportunity for a public hearing and finalization of recommendations for council. Uh, and finally, council will be positioned to consider final uh, action uh, on the ordinances on August 18th. Uh, thank you uh, to Chair Palmasano, and that, that concludes my comments, uh, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you for that presentation. We have a couple of colleagues in queue. First is Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Mayor. I had a question on the slide with the three positions. I noticed uh, for the city operations officer, it mentions that funding is specifically included for an executive search process, but that's not mentioned for the community safety commissioner. I'm wondering what your plans are for a search process or how you plan to fill that position given the prominence of this role. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Johnson. It's a, it's a good and fair question. Uh, we have already been doing quite a bit of search underway with uh, local uh, and national leaders, local and national organizations, uh, and I've been personally encouraged by the interest that we've seen. I've personally reached out to a number of these national organizations and local organizations, leaders from enforcement to civilian, from uh, COP21 to noble uh, to uh, either prosecutorial or attorney based in legal arms. Uh, we've made sure to do a, a number of, of outreach at this point. And at this point, I, I don't believe that we need another uh, search uh, for this position at this time. Uh, now, importantly, uh, if our ability to recruit a transformational leader for whatever reason stalls, uh, I'd be happy to revisit that conversation. Uh, but as of right now, things are moving forward and there is some interest from a uh, very high caliber candidates. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And are you able to leverage the search process for a police chief? Are you finding candidates in that that would be maybe qualified for a commissioner type role? Or is it turning up folks that might uh, be on your radar, I guess, from that? Chair Palmasano, Council Member Johnson, uh, certainly the search for 
the chief position uh, also allows for individuals that are applying for that position to also be of potential interest for the head of office of community safety. Now, importantly, as I've said before, and I'll say again, uh, I do not believe that the head of the office of community safety or the commissioner needs to be a sworn position. Uh, so while the search certainly leverages the interest, uh, it isn't necessarily conclusive for the outcomes. I appreciate that context. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Payne. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, yeah, just for context, uh, we have been briefed on this just over the last week. Uh, this is a bit of a pivot for our implement implementation path to be more iterative. I just wanna share that for the public for context, but um, I need to be honest that my first impression about this was I was a hard no because of all of the unanswered questions associated with pursuing code changes and as it relates to the complexity of charter changes. But um, I've since my briefing been able to have really constructive conversations with both the mayor, his staff, council leadership, and I am feeling um, that there's some really promising actions that we can take around the legislative support piece. That was one of the biggest missing pieces that I saw in this approach. Uh, I, I feel that there are some unanswered questions about hiring pretty high level executives in the enterprise and having not a lot of clarity yet for how that structure is gonna play out. And us as a legislative body, not necessarily having the resources that we need and I've gotten some really strong assurances from the mayor in our conversations around that legislative support. And so I'm looking forward to supporting this structure as we get to our formal vote on Thursday. And I'm hoping that we can have some follow through on those conversations. Um, but for today, I think I'm gonna abstain until I see what, uh, what, what, what those firm commitments look like, but I'm really encouraged by the direction that we're taking, so thank you. Just briefly, I know it wasn't a question, but Council Member Payne, thank you. And yes, you've made very clear uh, the desire to uh, ensure that a, a the legislative team from within the council has support uh, and has funding. And I hear you entirely. Thank you, Council Member Wansley. Thank you, Chair Mom, uh, Pomisano. I just have three questions. The first being around. Um, how community input has shaped this proposal, just for a comparison. Um, the Hennepin Ave Reconstruction Project hosted uh, several open houses. We had our own staff um, attend dozens and dozens of neighborhood association meetings um, to the point that the project received you know, more than 10,000 comments on the design. Also for our transit action plan, Public Works created an uh, eight page document outlining a comprehensive multi-phase community engagement plan that also included a code of ethics. That said, can you share what kinds of public engagement you did to inform um, this entire uh, government restructure reorganization plan um, outside of, I know you had a closed uh, work group uh, that you had as well as um, the staff led implementation teams that you pulled together. Uh, Madam Vice President, uh, Council Member Wamsley, uh, First off, we had an entire year's worth of an election uh, that ultimately led to the public and the residents of our city making a decision that they wanted to move towards a clear executive form in the mayor, a clear legislative form in the council. Uh, that was followed up by uh, bringing together several experts, uh, community leaders from a variety of different perspectives, including those that were opposed to question one. Uh, to find a best and most suitable structure for moving forward. Uh, there, there are some fairly specific questions that need to be answered internally uh, about how we conduct our day-to-day -day operations. Uh, and so that was laid out in long form with a report that was made very public, which we've gotten positive feedback on. Uh, and so now, uh, we are moving forward with the positions themselves, and specifically, again, this is for approval of the uh, Commissioner for the Office of Community Safety, um, the Head of the Office of Public Service, uh, and the Auditor. The Auditor, by the way, is separate. Um, uh, that was not necessarily included in long form in the, um, I guess it was included in the report, but, but, but th that was a separate entity, uh, and of course, that is uh, council purview. 
Oh, just to uh, clarify, I have two more questions to uh, Chair Pomisano. Um, so you you noted the first part, the public made a mandate for this with the election, which I think you stated earlier around question one, that was implemented, this is follow up. Um, and just follow up on, you said positive uh, feedback to the work group findings, another, another part that was somewhat closed door. Um, can you share outside of that, how you engage residents? And I know from wards one through ward 13, how you've also engaged like our constituents and our respective wards around this. Council member, for today, we're talking about the approval for the of positions. Uh, as ordinances and code changes are made, of course, as you know, there are baked in requirements for public engagement in hearings, which will inevitably take place. That is part of the process that's built into the process, and it's a process that I'm committed to. Uh, but to be clear, the, the notion that the voters uh, approved the charter amendment and the city has no further action after that, that would be laughable. But it was implemented. Second question. Um, nine months ago, you noted this too, we had over 140,000 people come out to vote on the future of public safety. Of course, there were tons of divided opinions on that, um, but it was very clear many of our constituents were interested in coming together to shape um, a path forward. Can you also share what other public engagements you did to inform your proposal? I know we're talking about three positions, but the fact that we're considering also an entire reorganization structure before these positions, I think it's imperative to have these questions um, answered. Um, so other engagements you did with the public to inform the community or Office of Community Safety outside of, again, of the private work groups and the implementation teams that will come in the weeks following. So we're talking about before then. So outside of conversations that I've had directly with constituents, public hearings, which will be underway and is required by the law, an entire election which took place last year where we debated extensively the merits of both proposals and where I thought there was broad support for this notion of having an integrated approach to uh, community safety. Uh, an integrated approach where we can pull together all of these different departments under one roof, and of course, the work group recommendations, which uh, have, uh, again, a broad spectrum of community leaders uh, with a number of different perspectives that just issued their recommendations yesterday, and by the way, in favor of this particular uh, move for an Office of Community Safety. Uh, that's where the, uh, the, the public engagement has been, and I would call it quite extensive. I will also note for the record, um, I have the opportunity to go to the one community engagement session. I know that many of my colleagues did that that public safety work group held. So that's why I'm asking for a broader synopsis of what outside of the work group in that one community session that they held with the public that was also not poorly, it was very poorly attended. We had half of the people there that were staff. What in addition to the work group has your office done around engagement? Uh, Madam Vice President, Council Member Wamsley asked and answered. So, well, last question then, since that one wasn't answered. Um, can you confirm how will it be possible to have a comprehensive public safety office that provides equitable services if MPD is not subjected to the same policies and levels of accountability as other public safety departments, which this legislative body will have oversight on. Um, for the public rec record and with clarity, I, I know this is confusing, um, especially since we'll have legislative authority over all of the departments in the Office of Community Safety with the exception of MPD. So how will you be able to standardize that level of accountability in those policies in this one department? A big part of standardization is bringing the MPD in line with the rest of the enterprise, one, and two, making sure that they have a comprehensive approach where they're not on an island by themselves. Uh, Council Member Wamsley, this is a position that I know that you long supported through an entire campaign. It's a position that I have long supported as well. If you've changed your position, that's certainly a prerogative. My position hasn't changed. Thank you, Mayor Fry. I think clarity again, you're the only one in the position after question one passed that has sole authority over MPD, I'm asking again, we will not have that authority over MPD and you're putting them in a department where you're the only one who will be able to enact legislative, any type of oversight over them. That will not happen with the rest of the departments that you're also playing in, which we do have oversight over. 
So there's not a position that has been changed. I've asked you this last April, how are you standardizing that process? Councilmember Wamsley, I, if you could re rephrase that question, I don't understand what you're asking. Again, how will you standardize that? Only because MPD is essentially on the island because you're the only one who has oversight over them. We're gonna be in the process of making policies and decisions for the rest of these departments that you're putting into the Office of Community Safety what we pass will not have any uh, application to MPD. So there is going to be a disconnect. How do you reconcile that? Are you talking about from a legislative function? From both. And you're putting MPD in a department where you only have oversight over. We're going to be able to make legislative changes for the rest of the departments with the exception of MPD. So that's why I'm asking before we vote on taking money to, out, to create a position, how will we reconcile that lack of standardization? There will not be a same level of policies and standardizations of those policies since we won't have that shared legislative authority with one another. Well, there is standardization of policies. Uh, every department is different to a certain extent. Uh, and in this case, uh, we've taken great efforts to bring forward reforms, one, but then two, to do so transparently. Uh, we just issued a, a disciplinary matrix very publicly with a disciplinary reset very publicly. Uh, we just issued just yesterday at a council meeting a whole revamp to our field training officer policy as well. Council members could ask questions. Those questions could get answered by MPD. Uh, that is the structure that we have in place. That is the structure that the voters chose to go with. Uh, and we are now in the process of implementing it through, again, we're talking about these three positions is what we're talking about today. And the three, I just want to clarify again, you're absolutely right. The voters affirm question two you have authority over MPD. I'm saying, how do we reconcile those challenges? If we pass, for instance, a policy in the next future you know, council meeting with this establishment of the department, that policy on the legislative side will only apply for all of the departments without MPD as of now. Is that correct? Are you asking me because you don't know the answer to that question? I don't need to know you're the one who has authority over MPD, so that's why I'm asking. Hey, council member, I, th I think you know what the voters ultimately chose, uh, and I think it is fairly clear. Uh, if there are questions that are related to these items before us, uh, I'm certainly happy to answer them. Right now, we're approving the positions. No, I think I'm asking a very direct question, Mayor Fry. Will the policies that we make on the legislative side also apply to MPD in this new department? Councilmember Wansley, if I may, I might redirect your question appropriately to our city attorney because he would be the one to weigh in on that. Well, this, that isn't a decision by Mayor Fry. I don't know how that wouldn't be. Also, I asked this question in April. You all told me to connect with the city attorneys. Did not get a response. That's why I'm asking Mayor Fry today. And this seems like a straightforward question about like legislative scope. It, I think it is a discussion about who has the power and who's in what lane. And so city clerk, uh, I, I guess I'm asking you, I, I think this is a question for the city attorney and I'm gonna defer this to the city attorney and if he's not ready to answer, I'm happy for you to take this offline. Uh, Madam Vice President, um, it's, a, it's a little bit difficult to answer it off the cuff, but you know, the council does have uh, some limited legislative authority over the police department. So for example, when there are ordinances that are passed requiring um, uh, anti-discrimination, um, civil rights, um, those can impact the police department. So on broad levels, there remains legislative impact. Um, similarly, the legislative impact on other departments is limited also. That's only on the broadest legislative policy. So you don't have legislative impact on day-to-day -day operations. So each of those have a variation of some level, but um, you, know, you have your legislative impacts and budgetary considerations over all departments, including police departments. So mm -hmm. there are legislative factors that play on each one of these. Specifically where, where each one of them plays is dependent on all the facts and all the circumstances that one might lay out. But there, it's not a either or, it's, there's this different ends of a continuum on the con kind of control you might have. 
Thank you, City Attorney and Gender. I wanted to know clarification. The question that I asked was then the scope of our legislative authority to pass policies. Could you also name an example like a president where we've been able to do this or have done this as a council of passing anti-discrimination policies that went and was then enacted over NPD? But I think I'm asking a question of policy and how that then is applicable to NPD considering they're not under our authority. Again, um, through the chair, there may be some policies that may be applicable. It depends. And there are policies that are passed by the council that sometimes the mayor agrees with and um, apply to the particular police department. I've seen that happen in the past where there may have been issues whether the council had authority to implement a policy, but the mayor agreed with the policy that was implemented, and so it took, it took effect. So there's... Any example? I would love to point to a president or learn of a president. Mm -hmm. Body camera, body worn cameras. Mm. Um, I, bl I believe body worn camera was one. Another one that I, I recall was, um, um, and I'm blanking on the name of the ordinance, that uh, did not permit um, officers to inquire into immigration status. Immigration status. Yes, and so that was a, a broader ordinance that covered all city departments. Um, it was questionable whether the council had authority to do that for um, the police department. However, the mayor at the time acceded to that, and um, the, the police have followed that policy. Okay. But, you know, again, that was with the mayor decided to go along with that policy. Mm -hmm. But So there are instances where that has occurred, and sometimes it depends on whether the mayor chooses to exercise their authority in that area or in consultation with the council to go along with it. And it's in their discretion, just clarity, because they are the ultimate ones who have authority to enact any reforms over MPD. The, the mayor has, has always had the executive authority over um, MPD and, and mm -hmm. currently has executive authority all, over all of the other Chapter 7 departments in the Charter. Mm -hmm. So um, that kind of authority is not that dissimilar. It's, it's called out more clearly mm -hmm. in, in the ordinance governing the police department, but that similar authority exists for all departments that are under the mayor's control. Mm. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you. Council Member Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to comment on these changes coming forward today and just say that I really appreciate all the work that went into this. I know it was a lot and uh, staff and community uh, members involved in the mayor's office uh, worked uh, very quickly to try to respond to the Charter Amendment number one passing and make sure that it could be effectively implemented and that there uh, was a responsive uh, administrative structure in order uh, to best run this organization, this enterprise. And I think that's reflected overall in the changes today. I know I'm sure all of us can point at one thing here or there and say, oh, maybe this position over here would be better, or this one over here would be better. Um, and there's going to be room for conversation or uh, disagreements on that. But I think overall, uh, I'm uh, pleasantly surprised and happy with the outcome of this and just want to uh, recognize the work that went into it and also uh, explicitly state on the commissioner role how important I think that is and what value that brings. That was one of the uh, positives that I saw in uh, Charter Amendment Number 2, which uh, voters did not approve, uh, but is one of the things that I think when you ask people why they didn't support it, they never said because of the commissioner, at least the people that uh, I spoke with in the community didn't say that. And I, I think there, when I was explaining to them at least the intention behind that, I think there was a lot of receptivity to that, this idea of somebody that has a strong organizational management background that can really do the reorg, the process work in order to support ultimately the department. And I can also do the integration with the other functions as well. And so. I'm uh, particularly pleased to see that uh, in this, and I do think there's certainly, we're gonna have to have a pretty exceptional candidate for that role because it's a big task, but also a huge opportunity as well for somebody to roll up their sleeves and bring a lot of experience and expertise uh, to really the challenge of probably their careers uh, as well. And so uh, overall, really think this is great and really appreciate it and wanted to make sure that that was said. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councilmember, 
I, there's a couple more people in queue. Um, Council Member Wansley, and then Council Member Chavez, and then I plan to move a vote on three, four, and five together unless there's objections from my colleagues. Council Member Wansley. Uh, I would like to swap places with Council Member Chavez. Thank you, thank you, Chair Provisano and Mayor Fry. I had my briefing on the structure this Thursday and had a hopeful conversation on it, conversations that I expect and hope that Ward 9 residents uh, are involved in, and I know they're eager to be involved and heard. I will be voting to send these specific ones to council today, uh, but do expect and been having conversations with the mayor's office that OPI stays intact in this process, that our legislative structure is adequately staffed, and that my office continues to receive these updates that have been guaranteed through this process so I can be fully comfortable by Thursday. I do wanna say though, <laughs> That I do continue to think that the pathway forward to this is through a charter change rather than, rather than an ordinance, uh, simply because I expect that all 13 council members and the mayor's office work together as we move forward through this new government structure that will change the lives of many people. So I'm supportive of sending this to full council, but do wanna say that I want all of us to work together on this structure. I think it's important that everybody's board is being heard, but happy to vote yesterday. Thank you, Councilmember Chavez. Councilmember Wansley. Thank you, Chair Palmasano. Similar to Councilmember Johnson, just have some comments more so for my constituents for this being, you know, public record. Um, I want to recognize just our current political landscape. I know ordinary people are fearful about the state of our democracy, um, not only as a result of the events that's happening nationally around SCOTUS, but right here locally. And we're seeing our residents show up with mass action around protecting reproductive rights every single day. We saw that even with the brave actions that our city staff uh, took just a few weeks ago of raising the level of racism, racism and toxicity that exists here at the city. Um, that said, I know the public wants to be actively involved in charting a course forward for our city. Over the last few weeks myself, I've attended community uh, meetings across my own ward. I hosted a university area public safety meeting that had over 100 people there. And no matter the frustrations and disagreements people had, they value having someone from the city come and listen to them and discuss action steps. Um, from today's presentation, I think it's, it's clear that there's still not a formalized plan. There's still unclear lines of authority. Um, the proposal still doesn't possess a robust level of data and public input. Um, and changes to our government is, is going to be very significant. I think all of us have talked about this, and they will outlast every single one of us. And we're doing this even not two weeks out from, again, appointing um, leaders where, again, we're still addressing dynamics of racism in the city. So, you know, a piecemeal strategy, I think something that Councilmember Chavez just raised with no long-term vision is setting us up for failure. Question one has been implemented for nearly seven months. There's no reason to rush this process when we have the opportunity to regain public trust and the, and the city's credibility with our own constituents and community members. The government structure should be an opportunity to show that the city is serious about rebuilding a better Minneapolis and wants to do that in partnership with the public. So that I would like for us to delay this a cycle for you all, the mayor's office, to come back with a robust engagement process of how we can actually bring the public into this, because I don't think they have been. We're going by November, November actions, question one was implemented. This is something different, and I think as Council Member Chavez highlighted, we want to be able to do this in partnership with each other, but that partnership must include the public as well. Thank you for these comments. Council Member Vita. Thank you, Vice President Palmasano. Um, I just want to speak to the Commissioner of Community Safety specifically because, uh, you know, my team did some work with some community conversations around the chief search. And I just want to, uh, for the record, I want to put it out there that this position came up a lot in those uh, community conversations from community members. Uh, the opportunity for the city to have someone leading uh, um, our police department, our fire, our emergency response, that is not a sworn in police officer. It came up at every single community conversation. Uh, so I think it's important that, you know, we have community input, of course, but I mean, I've heard this over and over and over again from the, the online versions of the forms, 
people in person, people reaching out at the grocery store, even in my front yard. So like, I this is something that I've heard the people of Minneapolis say. I'm so happy that we heard them loud and clear and we're making this an option for our new government structure. There's so many ways we could have went with this. And this is one of the ways that I'm super proud that um, we're, we're thinking about doing this. And and, and I, I have some questions, you know, about this process, especially with health. I feel like health can be lost in this, the way that the government structure is. And health is a big deal uh, to our city, especially we're living in times of a global pandemic. And so my fear is that some departments can get lost. But I'm working with the mayor's office and working with my colleagues on the council to figure out what that looks like. But this this uh, commissioner of community safety, I mean, I think we're getting it right with this. I think we're really uh, doing what the people of Minneapolis are asking for here. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further questions from my colleagues? I'm not seeing anybody in queue or flags up. So first I'm going to ask the clerk to please receive and file number two, the mayor's proposed executive reorganization plan. And I'm going to put forward a motion for items three, four, and five. And so that would be to pass the resolution um, to add resources for these following positions for the rest of this year. I'm going to, um, sorry, there's a number of things happening here. Um, going, going to vote to establish the appointed position of city operations officer and community safety commissioner. Um, so I will put forward that motion. Do my colleagues have any further comments? First council member Payne, you just removed yourself. So council member Chavez, no. All right, then um, I'll ask the clerk to then call the roll on that motion. It gives yeah, clarity. <laughs> oh, Councilmember Ellison, sorry I didn't see you there. No, I was I was I was a little uh, late on the on pulling that. Um, just wanted to echo some of the comments that I heard from some of my colleagues uh, regarding uh, some being encouraged by the direction that we're by, that we're headed in. We've had a lot of conversations with the mayor's office, and I and I am encouraged by the direction that we're headed in. Uh, but I want to echo Councilmember Payne in saying that you know I think there's a few assurances with regards to you know, ensuring that the council still has some sort of ability to do its work. Um, and I want to make sure um, that we've got, uh, you know, some of those assurances uh, a little bit firmer than maybe uh, a good faith handshake and before we're moving forward. Uh, but otherwise, and so I'll be abstaining uh, alongside Councilmember Payne today. I do look forward to getting myself to a yes by Thursday, uh, as I do feel like a lot of those conversations have been good, they've been healthy and happening in good faith. So uh, just wanted to note that for the record. Um, uh, and, and for the public, just to, just to say, you know, while, uh, while this is the will of the people and I'm excited to sort of move us in this direction where we can execute this government structure, I do wanna make sure that Council members still feel can be confident that they can serve their constituents, um, and uh, and so that's that's been um, the thing that I'm most concerned about. So uh, wanted to note that for the record uh, before we uh, call the roll. Thank you. Thank you. I think I would acknowledge there's broad agreement on that. And while we don't want to hold up this step, it's not that these other steps aren't extremely important and should come as soon as possible. Council Member Chugtai. Just real quick, uh, um, Council Member Palmasano, I asked you briefly um, just now, but wanted to clarify, I, I know there's, I know we're working actually in really good partnership um, right now with the mayor's office on getting some of the legislative uh, pieces figured out and I agree it all of it seems uh, incredibly promising and and the most forward momentum I think we've seen um, on, on government structure and hopefully the start to a lot more uh, strong partnership between um, the legislative and executive uh, branches and so I wonder if it's possible for us to um, forward these items to council without recommendation, knowing that by Thursday we are planning on having the um, the legislative department piece codified in a, in a more um, serious way. And I understand your, your point about not wanting to take up a bunch of items separately. And, you know, I, I would be 
it would make sense to me even on Thursday for us to vote on, you know, all four of those items together um, because they are a part of, you know, one thing that we're doing. So I appreciate your comments, council member. I think that the motion before us is to approve. So unless there is a substitute motion that you want to put forward to, um, to change that, which you're welcome to do. Um, if not, we're going to, we're still on this motion, which would be to okay. approve these things and send them to council. Okay, thank you for that. Is it possible for me to, not possible, okay. Thank you. Are there any other substitutions or proposals otherwise? I'll ask the clerk, oh, council member Ellison. Just uh, for clarity, and maybe this is a, usually I feel like I have a pretty decent handle on the rules, but why, why wouldn't it be appropriate for Councilmember Chiktai to make a substitute motion here? It's out of order, I'm sorry, through the chair, it's out of order to substitute or to attempt to amend a motion to achieve a separate motion. What's before you is to approve. You can vote it up or down, and if it doesn't pass, then you could make the motion. Got it. Thank you so much, mm -hmm. Mr. Clerk. Thank you. I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Payne. Abstain. Councilmember Wansley. Abstain. Councilmember Brainville. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Abstain. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. Councilmember Chugtai. Abstain. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Vice Chair Chavez. Aye. Chair Palmasano. Aye. I have nine yeas and four abstentions. Thank you. That motion passes. Again, it looks like we will have some additional items ready to codify in some way uh, by the full council meeting. So now we are going to transition out of this government structure subcommittee and back to the regular committee of the whole, which again is all of us, um, and move on to our next topic, which is a walk-on topic about the Hiawatha Maintenance Facility. We have an update from our last committee of the whole presentation, and I will call on Council Member Chavez to give that update. Thank you, Chair Pomasano and Council Members. Here's an update to the Hiawatha Maintenance Facility Expansion. You should have in front of you an RCA, a fiscal note, a RIA, and supporting documents for this walk-on item in the agenda. The East Phillips Neighborhood Institute and Ward 9 Community Meters met yesterday from 5 to 7 p.m. with Mayor Fry and Public Works and Department Leadership and discussed further initiatives. There'll be some edits to this possibly I think on Thursday at full, full council, uh, discussing some communication with MPCA about a third party uh, vendor and implementations and discussions further with our city uh, lawyers and EPME's legal team as well. So other additions, we'll be discussing investments in public health, a traffic study, prioritization on fully electrifying our fleet at the site, uh, but there will be something to vote on this Thursday at full council, so. Thank you. If there's any questions. Yeah, I open up the floor to any questions about this update. I know we have Director Anderson Kelleher in the room, um, as well as others that have been part of these discussions in detailed ways. I'm not seeing any right now. Um, so thank you for that update. Um, and that's all we will be doing on that um, item. The next item we have is the other walk-on item on the housing stabilization work group. Um, we have a motion by council member Osman and I think I will call on council member Osman or whoever you suggest to, to tee this up. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my colleagues, a few months ago, we spent a lot of time talking about the guidelines of our rent stabilization work group one of the items that come up during the debate was questioning over tier two or tier three properties. It wasn't part of, of the original proposed by the staff. I'm bringing forward today an amendment to clarify a little bit. Uh, we don't need explosive landlords 
ad, um, landlords advising us on um, what to do on making policies. We don't need bad actors to be given voice by the city to engage policy making, but we do need to hear from some of the most meaningful partners we have in housing in Minneapolis. My amendment drafted in consultation with regulatory services is that no landlords with tier three license be allowed, no landlords with more than 5% of their portfolio in tier two can be allowed on the work group. Our affordable housing providers are important, part of the solution here in Minneapolis. But by the very nature of their work, they have taken on distress and older properties to preserve and maintain affordability. They have taken uh, on properties that have been identified as a problem by regulatory services. Uh, they, have, they rehabbed and brought them um, in a, a condition that is safe uh, for the folks that need housing. But everything I just talked about, uh, buying old properties, taking on properties that had a lot of police calls under the previous owner, all of those will contribute when it comes to tier rating. My staff working along with council, council president and vice president staff as well with the mayor's office have identified a couple partners we need at least to be able to consider for the work group because of their experience and value. I urge my colleagues to support this amendment. If there's any question, I'm glad to take this. And also, I believe regulatory services are here to answer some of those questions. Thank you. Um, for those in the audience, there are copies of the motion by Council Member Osman on the dais there. Um, all of my colleagues have this recommended work group structure change or proposal before you. Again, this is to change the I guess give, make a slight change to our rent stabilization work group. And we have a number of members in queue. Council President Jenkins. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And I, I just wanna note, I will be supporting this um, motion by Council Member Osmond. I wanna thank the staff work group for their diligence and um, uh, work on this um change to uh this amendment to the resolution which as we were talking to various um stakeholders who who want to be a part of this process um we realized that um and I, and I should say staff realized that some of the two tier uh or tier 2 properties actually have individuals that we really want to be a part of this conversation. And what we know is that, you know, anytime you're having large rental portfolios, there will be some issues and challenges that uh, could potentially um, create these multiple tier scenarios. And so we're not looking at tier three or um, other um, sort of representations, but rather ensuring that we have some voices that we really want to be a part of this conversation. So thank you, Councilmember Osman, for bringing this forward, and I look forward to supporting this. Uh, I would encourage my colleagues to as well. Thank you, Councilmember Goodman. Thank you, Madam President. As many of you recall, I argued very passionately against excluding Tier 2 properties when we brought this forward before. So let me just add a bit of context. Tier 2 property owners can be people who have had, um, didn't pay a rental license fee or paid a rental license fee a month late. And then they get knocked into a Tier 2 property and then it doesn't get changed until it's reviewed again and that could take time. Sometimes it could take up to six months. And so I wouldn't say that tier two property owners are problem property owners universally. Uh, when you have property owners who have challenged properties, they could miss an inspection. 
They could not be there when someone is supposed to be there to do some sort of inspection, and that knocks them into Tier 2. If we rule out Tier 2 properties, as I've said before, many nonprofit CDCs would be ruled out of participating in this process. So basically what I said before has now come true, and you have this long list of people who want to participate, and half of them are ruled out because they have one Tier 2 property. It makes no sense. Tier 3, that's a different story. Tier 2 is like a warning. Once you get to Tier 3, those are people who have been reminded over and over again to do something that they have not done appropriately. So I am really grateful of the work of the Council President and Vice President and Council Member Osman who have taken this super seriously as they work towards getting a very um, active and diverse group of people to be on this uh, rent control work group. I think you're going to have to take Tier 2 property owners or you have not very many choices left. Thank you. Council Member Ellison. Uh, thank you. I uh, uh, don't have a ton to add. I do want to say that the original spirit of the of the motion that we're now modifying is was to make sure that um, we didn't have exploitative uh, uh, actors, bad actors involved in this process. Uh, and I just wanted to say that that. Uh, when I'm looking at this change, the change is pretty narrow in scope and I think a very informed change uh, led by Councilmember Osmond. So I both want to commend, uh, I believe it was Councilmember Wansley for initiating this, this, this direction to make sure that we've got uh, uh, good people on the board. But I also, and I, and I also want to thank Councilmember Osmond for this modification. Um, you know, in some cases, it's not just that these tier two properties, um, uh, uh, you know, are for relatively small reasons. In some cases, when you do have a, a, a landlord that you don't want, we're asking some of these, uh, some of our nonprofit developers to take on tier two properties. And that tiering stays with the property. It doesn't change at the start of new ownership. Uh, and so you might have somebody who's gonna be getting that, that who just bought a property, uh, and they're gonna be getting those into tier one uh, in, 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 in sort of no time. So. Um, and we don't want to discourage. Uh, you, we don't want to discourage those nonprofit developers or or, or anyone uh, from taking on tier two properties that they intend to improve. So, um, supportive of the change, but also wanted to note that I was supportive of the of the uh, original intent, uh, which was to make sure that we did not have um, uh, bad actors uh, influencing policies in our city. So, uh, just want to thank Councilmember Wansley. Also, want to thank Councilmember Osmond. So that's all. Thank you, Councilmember Wansley. Thank you, Chair Pamasamo. I wanted to see if one of our staffers from CPEP was here to just answer any questions. I know that we received an email from uh, Joey Dobson on June 8th, uh, just an update um, provided to us considering the deadline for the work group was June 6th um, and noted that we received 46 applications. I see here that at that time we were still compiling data on you know whether or not licenses for property owners if they had any two tier two or three properties was is there anyone who can provide a overview of of where that was and why we think now after the deadline this will help us i see ms dobson getting up uh, and approaching the stand so maybe she can provide some clarification welcome thank you good afternoon uh, thank you chairman palmasano and to council member wansley um, so I can give a little bit of an overview of the applications that we received. Um, so as, you're, as you stated, the deadline for applications for the council and mayoral appointments, there are 12 of them in total, seats that we're looking to fill here, six for renters, three for property owners, and three for developers. Um, I will note some entities identify as both a property owner and a developer, so there is a little bit of crossover um, with some of those applications. But just to give an overview, yes, there were 46 applications for those for all of those 12 seats that we received. Uh, 21 of the 46 were rent, renters for those six renter seats. 18, or the, the remaining 25 were for the property owner and developer seats. So we received 20, total 25 for property owners and developers taken together as one category. Um, based on analysis um, that rent services provided, um, for the process, there were a total of seven of those 25 applications um, were individuals who were um, associated with an entity that had at least one tier two property. So there were seven applications um, representing six entities. We, we did receive two applicants for the same, that are associated or work with the same entity. So out of the 25, seven of the applications 
um, were identified as having or being associated with at least one tier two property. Okay, so we're essentially making this amendment to apply to existing or to allow existing applicants to part, potentially fulfill those roles on the work group. I'm not sure that's a question for, oh, for staff, yeah. um, but to, um, to the extent that I can answer, my understanding is that of the amendment would be that it would be to potentially make some of the applications eligible, again, who wouldn't be under the previous draft. But that, that's, I'm not sure that's a question. We will staff. actually defer to the author. So Council Member Osman, um, is, is the intention with this to make some of the other applications that were received by this deadline eligible and open to some of these tier two applicants? I think that's the case, Correct. but I wanted to confirm yes. with you. Okay, thank you. Awesome. And just so public, the those who are on or eligible to join this work group, this is all public information so folks could see who the 25 or who the seven are right now. Um, Chair Palmasano and to Council Member Wansley, I would um, want to defer any questions about public data to uh, perhaps the clerk's office, but mm -hmm. it is my understanding that at least some of that information is is public data, but I would um, mm -hmm. defer to the clerk's office for that information. But all of, mm -hmm. I have provided, or our team has provided all of the council offices and the mayor's office with mm -hmm. the, the details of the, of the applications that we received. Perfect. Clerk Carl, um, I believe all the applicants' names are public, although the information on that application is not entirely public, is that correct? Madam Vice President, you're correct. The application form identifies uh, on its face what data is public and what data is not public. Decision makers, because of a business need to know, are given the full application. When we make those applications available to the public, the clerk's office works with the departments that submit to redact and make uh, public versions of the application form that have the private or not public data removed. Sounds good, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Chugtai. Um, Ms. Dobson, if you could just stick around for another second. Um, I, I just want to clarify that I'm understanding what you shared correctly. Of the, of the three seats that um, go to um, property owners um, and developers, we received 25 applications of people who would qualify, or it's the 60. Right. Um, my memory. Thanks for that question, Chair Palmasano and um, to Council Member Chugtai. So again, there are 12 seats that are That's council right. and mayoral appointees. Six are for renters, and there are some more specific categories there. Three are for property owners, one of whom has one rental license, and one of whom is a participant of the, the city's 4D uh, affordable housing program. And then there's, so there's three for property owners, and then an additional three for um, property developers. And I just noted that there are some um, entities that are both developers and property owners. So it would be up to the council and mayor to sort of decide which seats they might want to fill with which um, applicants. And so we received a total of 25 applications for those two categories, for those 12, or excuse me, for those six seats together. Great. Um, so 25 applicants for six seats, and then seven of those 25 applicants uh, were uh, you know, more or less disqualified because of the tier two, um, because they, they have a tier two property, or the tier two status, thank you. Yes, Chair Palmasano and Council Member Chugtai, um, we identified seven of the applications as having tier two properties, or at least one tier two property. That's great. So then we, but we still have 18 other applicants who also all really want to participate um, and have their, their, their voices as a, a part of shaping the conversation. And we still only have six seats to, to fill with those 18 applicants. I'm, I guess I'm uh, like, I think that's the end of my questions for you, and then I will direct the question perhaps to the authors or maybe to um, you know anyone else that, that cares to jump in here, but I, I'm just trying to understand then. I know when we first uh, codified this, this work group and uh, you know all of the different um, all of the different requirements of who was going to participate and, and what made a person eligible or ineligible. Uh, it was, I mean, it was one of our longest council meetings, and we went back and forth many, many, many times on what we, um, 
wanted to see in that work group. And so, you know, now we're here at the end of June. The deadline uh, for applying has closed. We're getting ready to actually, you know, move forward with with the formation of of the actual work group and in like so near the end of that process for us to um, make a change when there are 18 perfectly eligible people for six seats um it just i'm confused by why we're doing that thank you i appreciate those as question as comments and then an open question council member ellison are you here to yeah i help I'm answer that to defer question to council member osmond if, if he wants to be, oh, oh i go ahead. i uh i like i'm i'm i feel like through some of the briefings i've gotten i've gotten maybe privy to information that i'm not sure if i can say at the dais so i'm going to be careful about how i speak on this but my understanding is that some of the people who are currently sort of ineligible would be preferable and maybe more knowledgeable about the needs of renters than some of the others who are who are technically eligible. So, for example, you know, there's a uh, a developer, a nonprofit developer in my ward. They have been incredibly instrumental in how um, and in helping us deal with everything from like the con portfolio to you know other other uh, properties that have been issues. Um, They've been really great about tenant protections and have even been advocates for tenant protections. Uh, you know, but they've also uh, sometimes at, my understanding is at our request, taken on tier two properties, for example, as a way to bring them up to, you know, as a way to improve them. Under these current, under the current guidelines, uh, and, the, and, and I think they're the also the only applicant to, um, uh, to have, uh, or one of the only applicants to have a person of color and a woman of color be the, be the person that would occupy that seat. I'm using, you know, so that's like one example of someone who might not be eligible based on the current criteria, who I think that we would want to, that's a, that's a, that's a perspective and some wisdom that we would potentially want on this, uh, on this body. Uh, but I'm, I'm not actually speaking to what staff will ultimately recommend. I'm just sort of giving an example of maybe one of the applicants that would be disqualified that we would want to at least have as a part of our consideration for being on, on the work group. Thank you for speaking from your personal experience. We won't be discussing specific individuals <laughs> here on the dais. Um, I don't see any other colleagues in queue. Um, so I will say we'll take up a motion um, to amend resolution 2022-R110, um, the Housing and Rent Stabilization Work Group, uh, revising the work group structure per council member Osmond's um, Motion. Clerk, will you please call the roll? Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Abstain. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. Councilmember Chugtai. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Vice Chair Chavez. Aye. Chair Palmasano. Aye. That's 12 yeas and one abstention. Thank you. That item carries. Next, and I apologize for this, we need to go back one step, back to the Hiawatha Maintenance Facility, um, because it has been corrected for me up here that we need to take a motion on that item and of that update these past two cycles. So I will entertain a motion to approve the memorandum of understanding agreement term sheet and authorize appropriate city officials to execute an agreement and other documents necessary to effectuate the settlement with EPNI, the East Phillips Neighborhood Institute. Um, is there any last comments on that item? We, I feel like we fully dispensed with it, except we needed to take this vote. I'm not seeing anybody jump into queue here, so I'm just gonna ask the clerk to please call the roll. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Abstain. President Jenkins. Aye. Councilmember Chugtai. Aye. 
Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Vice Chair Chavez. Aye. Chair Palmasano. Aye. That's 12 yeas and one abstention. Thank you, that carries. I also wanna just say, we talked about this a lot last time, but thank you to everybody up here on the dais who has played some role, you too, Mayor, before you leave, um, in trying to reach a, a place that we could all move forward here. It's been a long time coming. So um, last but not least, we need to go to committee reports. Um, the first committee report will be the Business Inspections, Housing and Zoning Committee that is chaired by Council Member Goodman. Thank you, Madam Vice President. The Biz Committee is bringing forward 16 items for approval on Thursday. Item one is the long-awaited malt liquor packaging ordinance. This will allow uh, brewers to be able to do off-sale cans and bottles as um, approved by the legislature. Item number two is also a long-awaited land sale at 800 Washington Avenue South. Item number three, the city's biggest development project. This is the land conveyance and tax increment plan for the Upper Harbor Terminal. Item number four is a variance appeal uh, that we uh, voted to grant. Item five are liquor licenses, uh, as are item six, approvals and renewals. Item seven are the gambling license approvals. Item number eight is a adjustment to our consolidated plan. Item nine are grant applications for LCDA and TOD rounds from the uh, various organizations, including the Met Council. Item 10 are appointments to the Advisory Committee on Housing. Item 11 is a bond issuance uh, for Hennepin County to do a project um, in the first ward. Item 12 is an extension for Penn Avenue Union's housing revenue bonds. Item 13 is the agreement for the name, image, and likeness of Prince Rogers Nelson. That's for the mural. Item 14 is an appointment by the mayor to the Family Housing Fund Board. Item 15 is a release of a conservation easement and deed destruction. And item number 16 is a commercial property development fund loan for 2700 Longfellow, which is the Longfellow, East Lake Street, which is the Longfellow Coliseum. Happy to answer any questions on items one through 16. Thank you, I'm not seeing any. Next is the Policy and Government Oversight Committee by Chair Councilmember Ellison. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Vice President. The Policy and Government Oversight Committee is bringing forward 15 items uh, that'll be recommended for approval. Uh, item number one is the passage of resolution related to the transfer of funds related to the Minneapolis Public Housing Authority scattered site construction project and the Housing Opportunity Fund. Item number two is accepting a bid for the Upper Harbor Terminal grading and demo project. Item number three is accepting a bid for the liquid, for liquid chlorine. Uh, item number four is accepting a bid for Minneapolis parking ramp sign replacement. Item number five is accepting a bid for public tow towing in District B, uh, District B Zone 5. Item number six is authorizing a contract with City of uh, St. Louis Park for Animal Sheltering Services. Item number seven is authorizing a contract with Hennepin County for digital elevation data. Item number eight is authorizing a contract with Aspen Psychological Consulting LLC for psychological evaluation services. Item number nine is authorizing contract amendment with Thomas and Sons Inc. for Franklin Avenue West reconstruction project. Item number 10 is authorizing contract amendment with uh, Granicus Inc. for subscription-based document hosting services. Item number 11 is authorizing a contract amendment with Marcon Construction Company Inc. for construction changes at the Target Center. Item number 12 is authorizing a contract amendment with Modern Piping Inc. for additional mechanical work for the Public Service Building Project. And item 13 is authorizing contract amendment with American Tower Inc. for various services at the Minneapolis Convention Center. Item number 14 is authorizing a lease agreement for the space at 1499 West River Road for the Office of Emergency Management and the Health Department. Uh, and then lastly, item 15 is related to the mayor's nominations for the Civil Service Commission. Uh, 15-1, we'll we will be withdrawing uh, the mayor's nomination of Elizabeth Peterson. And item 15-2, we will be granting consent to the mayor's nomination of William Walker. Uh, and then I'll just sort of note that, uh, uh, you know, uh, both of these folks were put forward. I think they're both incredibly qualified. Uh, we've had a lot of discussion with the mayor's office, and I think he will be um, uh, putting a new um, person forward in place of Elizabeth, Elizabeth Peterson in the near future. So with that, I'll stand for any questions. Thank you. I'm not seeing any questions at this time. 
Next, we have the Public Health and Safety Committee, chaired by Councilmember Vita. Thank you, Madam Vice President. The Public Health and Safety Committee is bringing forward seven items that it is recommending for approval. Item one is granting consent to the mayor's nomination of Barrett Lane to the appointed position of Director of Emergency Management. Item two is approving the Minneapolis Advisory Committee on Aging Appointments. Item three is approving Southside Green Zone Council appointments. Item four is approving the Police Conduct Review Panel appointments. Item five is accepting a police bomb disposal unit services grant from Minnesota Homeland Security and Emergency Management. Item six is accepting a 2022 National Forensic Sciences Improvement Grant from the Minnesota Department of Public Safety for the Police Crime Lab. And item seven is accepting the National Association of County and City Health Officials Grant for Overdose and Suicide Prevention. I'll stand for questions on these items. Thank you. I'm not seeing any questions. Next is the Public Works and Infrastructure Committee. That committee is chaired by Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Public Works and Infrastructure Committee is bringing forward six items on Thursday. The first is the 2022 Capital Improvement Program, Appropriation and Revenue Adjustments within the City's Capital Projects. Item number two and three are appointments to the Bicycle Advisory Committee and Pedestrian Advisory Committee. Item four is a grant from AARP for the Community Challenge, and items five and six are both large block event permits. I will stand for any questions. Thank you, I'm not seeing any questions. And last but certainly not least is the Audit Committee, and I've asked Council Member Payne to give that report. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Uh, the Audit Committee is bringing forward three items uh, for Council to review. Item number one is a report on the personal work issued mobile device policies and controls audit report. Item number two is the Minneapolis Police Department field training officer program special project report. And item number three is the report of the internal auditor. And I will stand for any questions. Thank you. I'm not seeing any questions. With that, we have exhausted all the items on our agenda and without any further ado i'll adjourn this meeting thank you for everybody's just, time today just as you predicted okay so.